is Guillaume, who will be talking about inter IMAP. I hope I pronounced that right. For the next 10 minutes. So enjoy. Okay. Um, so, thanks. So, ah, that's not working very well. Oops. Okay, well, we'll have it working somehow. So first I would like to spend a couple of seconds uh, discussing the way people typically um, access, access uh, emails on a remote IMAP server. Uh, so the easiest way is to use uh, a, a webmail, that is a remote IMAP client. So it's super easy because you have nothing to install locally and the configuration is shared across uh, <coughs> small devices if you have many. Uh, and well, a common alternative is to use something like a local IMAP, uh, um, IMAP, IMAP client, like Thunderbird or Icelove. It gives you a bit more room uh, if you have uh, like fancy configuration or something. However, uh, like a major drawback of those approaches is that, um, well, it of course it requires internet access to browse existing messages, and also latency can be a problem if, uh, if you don't have uh, local caching. So, okay, so I want to access uh, my message um, without uh, having access to internet. So, uh, how do I do that? A common way to do that is to use something like uh, offline IMAP. Basically, what it does is it, it, takes, it synchronizes IMAP with the local mail via storage, uh, and then I can have well, offline access to my uh, servers. Uh, the problem with offline IMAP is that, to my, in my experience, I mean, it works quite okay, but in my experience, it doesn't really scale, and also it strains the network very badly. So this is what I mean by strain the network very badly. So I have under 100 mailboxes, I have 300,000 messages, something like that. Then it it, it uh, takes about one minute to run, and the traffic is really really bad. I mean, so it, it uses 14 megabytes of network. Uh, and if you have a compression that's enabled on the server side, uh, then you can bring it down to 1.5 megabytes, but it's still very, very much. And that's, I mean, so much, it's not something I want to run in a train every two minutes, which is what I envision here. Oh. Okay, well, so, um, we don't want to do a read there uh, each time we open the mailbox, uh, which, I mean, read there is the syscall that's being done when you, uh, for, for mail there, storage. Uh, and the solution for that is to install an IMAP server, uh, so in this example I will use Dovecot, between the mail user agent and the mail storage, and to let this IMAP server manage the, ca the cache instead of using uh, uh, the mail agent to manage the cache. So, so in the picture, this is what I mean. So in that case, I have, in that example, I have two uh, clients that access the media storage, and uh, then they are being sent using offline map to the remote map server. And what what I would suggest is to move from the left the, the left picture to the right one. That is, I teach IMAP to my mail client and to the status bar or something, and then I connect them to the local IMAP server. So I have IMAP on my laptop right now, for instance, and then I use IMAP synchronization instead of having mail there to uh, IMAP synchronization. Um, and uh, yeah, so also I should say that you don't have to uh, expose the IMAP server, you don't have to expose it to the network, you can use Unix socket instead, and, does, and Unix ACL, and that, that can be fast and secure. So a problem is that, uh, so the IMAP protocol as uh, designed in RFC uh, 3501 is not quite optimized for bidirectional synchronization. That is, the usual way you do synchronization between two IMAP servers is that you require each IMAP server to download the full list of, uh, mail use, um, of uh, user I, um, uh, unique identifier, and uh, mail unique identifier, sorry, and uh, uh, all the flags for those, and then you compare the list, the local list and the remote list, and then you uh, uh, well, sync the changes. Uh, and of course, that doesn't solve the issue with uh, network traffic. But there is a recent extension to the IMAP protocol, uh, RFC 7152, where essentially a server supporting this extension will associate every uh, uh, email with a 63 well, bit modification sequence. And then this modification sequence will be increasing whenever you have a change, like a new email or flag update or something like that. 
And the nice thing is that the uh, highest modification sequence of any mailbox is given in constant time. So now, detecting whether you have changes on the, on the, on the AMP server is proportional to the number of mailboxes instead of being proportional to the number of, ma uh, of the mails. So this is what InterIMAP is doing, and the performance boost is extraordinary. That is, we brought the one minute down to 0.6 seconds, and the traffic was brought from 1.5 megabytes to uh, under 10 kilobytes. And in fact, oh, in fact, it's so fast that uh, ideally I want, I mean, I want to uh, run into IMAP super often. Like, I, I want to run it like every five seconds or something. It's so fast that it doesn't make sense to uh, uh, run it every 10 minutes or something like that. And also one thing we noticed is that um, the uh, TCP and SSL overhead is quite, I mean, it's no longer negligible. It wasn't negligible with offline IMAP because offline IMAP has all this, uh, well, useless, I'm at traffic, but there it's really, I mean, it goes like the, the overhead is actually the bulk of the traffic there. So it makes sense to, in, to, uh, to implement a daemon instead and uh, keep the connection alive. So it makes sense because first you would have only a single, I mean, you would share the TCP connection, you would have, you would have a single SSL handshake, and also you would share the different compression dictionary if you happen to use uh, compression on the side. So this is, uh, uh, in this benchmark, I synchronize every five seconds and I kill the synchronization after five hours. And that's real uh, life benchmark. <coughs> Namely, I, I, I did get email during that five hours, while previously I didn't get any email. It was like a blank check. Um, and uh, well, I got only like under one megabyte of traffic. And uh, we can do even better with the uh, uh, IMAP notify extension, which is a, uh, yet another extension, which is, of course, not implemented on every server, I should say. But uh, if your server happened to use it, you can, it's the same with QAsync. If your server happened to use it, uh, you can be much, much, much uh, faster uh, to synchronize be uh, between two IMAP servers uh, than uh, the naive way, which is what offline IMAP is doing, for instance, and probably Thunderbird, offline mode of Thunderbird, and so on. Okay, so just to conclude uh, with a bunch of features, um, it supports a bunch of ways to, uh, uh, a different way to connect to the remote AMAP server. Uh, so INET socket with uh, star TLS or, or something like that, and also uh, uh, pipes. So either INET socket or pipes, like it's useful if you want pre-authenticated pre uh, session, for instance. It also supports the IMAP compass extension, which is very neat because it brings the network traffic down significantly. It has also native support for SOX 5. Uh, so if you want to uh, tunnel your connection through Tor, you don't need uh, like Torify or uh, LD, any other LD preload uh, hack. And uh, while well, it's licensed under GPL3 and the development started rather soon, uh, rather, um, I mean, not so long ago, like uh, uh, only four months ago or so. Uh, and uh, well, I wrote it personally and uh, I would I mean, soon it's, I would. I, I intend to uh, update, uh, to upload it to Debian, but first I would like to have, uh, I mean, a user base that I could count with my both hands and only, not only me using it. So please use it, try out, try it out, and report bugs and let me know. And that's it. Thanks.
I'll, intro I'll introduce the next speaker until he's starting to set the thing up. So the next speaker is Herb, who will be talking about vintage computing. talk a bit about one of my hobbies. Uh, I'm interested in vintage computing and I'll uh, start with a short overview. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, first the questions, what is vintage computing? Why should you do it? And uh, where can you people who are also interested? Um, the where part is unfortunately primarily focused on Romani because I used, uh, I moved to Sweden quite recently, but uh, if anyone can point out interesting conventions for vintage computing in Sweden, I would be happy. But more about later. Yeah, the basic question is, when do we start to talk about vintage computing? Uh, some people invented a basic rule that says 15 years. 15 years might have been working well uh, 20 years ago, but today, 15 years ago, was Windows XP. <laughs> so the more important rule is, it should be a bit older, but it should be really interesting and exciting. So even if it's only 10 years old, but it's a, a self-built computer that emulates something then that's also really uh, popular in the vintage computing scene and probably more interesting than a generic uh, laptop running Windows XP. So, uh, why, uh, now I will go to the question why, and first I'll talk about why I started using, uh, going into vintage computing. Um, it basically started when I figured out at school that there's more than just Windows and maybe also Linux, but there are lots of, uh, at the time there were lots of other uh, companies producing computers, especially the big manufacturers of workstations, Sun, SGI and so on. And I wanted to try it, and especially when I was still uh, at school, some workstations were still incredibly expensive. About 2000, 2002, you could easily pay uh, 60,000 DMARC, 30,000 Euro for a workstation. And now I get the stuff for free because people throw it away. Um, down here, unfortunately, my, you can't really see it, I guess. Uh, it's a small and rather old photo of my collection. Basically, a stack of old workstations, some screens, uh, a really old 486 comp uh, laptop that I used as a ser serial terminal. But uh, the next question is, uh, why should we be generally interested in vintage computing? Why should we care about old computers? Uh, one rule of thumb usually is uh, if you use your computer for work after about two years, it's too old to be really useful. Why should we care about computers that are 20, 30, 40 years old? Um, but uh, it's um, also uh, one of my interests to get a deeper understanding how computer works. Uh, and it's much easier to understand how a computer from the 80s works because you can easier imagine one K of RAM than two terabytes of RAM. And it also is a good, um, yeah, it's important to protect it for the further generations to show them how computers work or have worked. And I guess I'm running out of time. So there are, there are some events, uh, especially in Germany, connected to uh, vintage computing. The, quite fancy name, Vintage Computer Festival Europe, uh, takes place every year in Munich. 
a few years ago, the people started uh, creating a vintage computing festival in Berlin. They uh, also focus on computing, not computers, so they also uh, try to uh, include uh, analog computers and everything that might be interesting in connection with computing, using comp uh, solving computations. And I want, I want to close with a short plea. Uh, please don't throw away, if you have old computers, don't throw them away, don't scrap them. Uh, try to find someone who is interested. Google for them, like the Vintage Computing Festival or Computer Festival is easy to find. Contact the persons or in doubt, contact. Uh, you can also contact me if you know something. I, unfortunately, I can't really take mainframes myself, but I know that there are people who are interested also in preserving mainframes, and yeah, thanks. If you go to YouTube, you can, there's a link from it, because it, it's a long link to so I'm on the way to my have a link from my about page there. Okay, uh, and you search that thing, you can find my channel. Yeah, you can go to like, G-O-G-A, it doesn't matter. My channel, you click on my channel. And uh, to the right, on the screen. Uh, there, there is a link to my slides. Yes. Yep. Now I won't be ashamed because I use uh, Google Slides. <laughs> <laughs> presentation. Okay, the third speaker this evening is David, um, who will be talking about subnetting in P2P systems. Just use laptops. I use a very old stationary computer with a CRT screen. So that's a bit alien to me. Okay, um, I'm David, I'm from Sweden. Uh, I research fully serverless and fully distributed peer to peer systems, and I've done that since 1997. That's before Napster, mind you. Um, and that's what I do full time. Uh, so I'll just take one little thing from my usual very long talk, but the simplest thing that most people don't think about when they build a peer-to-peer -peer application. They build them kind of monolithic and put everything in one big network and do every kind of work on that single network, which is super inefficient. So instead, we should use, we, you should use subnetting. And this is not like subnetting in, TCP, in IP, it's more like subgrouping. That is like in torrents, uh, torrents we have separate swarms for separate, separate, separate files we're sharing. Uh, but we shouldn't use some more levels. So in a big future peer-to-peer -peer system, we should have a mother net. And the mother net is... Yeah, I'm actually on the wrong page, sorry. Yeah. Uh, some things is better done on a network when there's many uh, computers in the network, like finding the network, keeping track of network time, measuring statistics, calculating number of computers in a network, of course, then you need one network for that. But, for instance, if, diff uh, so if you have many different small peer-to-peer -peer applications that really aren't related, they can together form a big mother net and do those uh, things together in one huge network. So new networks at the start, uh, existing small ones, can use the big network for some of those services. And when they get bigger than themselves, they can help other small ones. And when they get older and shrink, 
they will again have help of the other applications. So underneath MotherNet we have several different application subnets. And also, of course, if some applications are cooperating, even if they can have a public shared subnet where they work together. application subnet level, so in your single application should then have several different service subnets underneath. The typical service subnet that most of you already encountered is the uh, BitTorrent swarm. So that could be a BitTorrent application with several different BitTorrent swarms underneath. But that could be other things also. If you have like an instant messaging application or voice over IP, IP application, where username, your username would be a single service subnet and everyone who wants to connect and talk with you will use the look lookup service or rendezvous service on this network to find your subnet and connect to you. Um, also, we can put chat rooms, you know, if it's a serverless peer-to-peer -peer chat, each chat room should be its own uh, ser uh, service subnet. So that means that messages for a chat shouldn't be sent on the big network and broadcast and transported by other nodes. Instead, all the nodes in that very chat room should connect to its own little swarm with direct TCP or UDP connections and you just broadcast messages within that little swarm. And they want that broadcast, they want that load, that traffic. So that's more, much more efficient. And one really cool thing we can do. Uh, those of you who don't know what the dis dispute hash table is, you probably uh, probably heard that it's an ongoing research. Most of them are really bad. Even the best ones still are really bad and easy to hack and destroy, by the way. Uh, so that's an ongoing research. But we can put uh, such a lookup database, or in, in one of the uh, subnets, and that means we can plug in newer versions and later versions of the software. And, and newer versions of the program can use both databases, and older versions can just use one in one subnet. So it can be future compatible in that way. So here's the complete view we have MotherNet on top, several applications, subnets, and underneath them, service subnets. And that's a concept that's very useful in, when you build peer to peer systems. Uh, so that was it. <laughs> Does anyone know who the next speaker is who's going to talk on? Oh. Yes, introduction to physical world things. Yeah. Yes, come. I don't have slides. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So. I'll let you know when you've got one. Okay. So my name is Michael Schnell from Benevitz, and uh, over at the Mozilla table, we have uh, a couple others. That um, there's Luna and there's Oliver, and we together are kind of uh, helping folks familiarize themselves with Mozilla technology. What we have uh, to show off are a series of uh, Firefox Flame devices, Firefox OS um, phones. And some people have been asking questions about what will happen tomorrow during the, um, the IoT workshops in the evening. And there's a sensory network uh, uh, lecture in the morning as well. What we're going to do is build a physical web using the Firefox OS devices and these beacons from Estimode. So we'll put these things in different places and let them broadcast and then get nearby with the phones and we'll see how a physical web of things operates and we'll build our own empire using IoT devices. We have about 150 computing devices, computers, sensors, and a variety of different things like beacons. So it's gonna be a, a fun time for everyone who likes to play with these kinds of things. Uh, that will be two sessions in the evening, the yellow, um, what is it called? Um, I forgot the track name. <laughs> Anyway, so any questions, you can come over to the uh, Mozilla uh, table, and we're going to get set up pretty soon. Uh, this evening we'll be setting up the room, which we're going to move to C363. It's just next door 
to the normal workshop rooms, and we'll have that advertised on the uh, door as well. So the table is a Mozilla table here, Firefox OS, and tomorrow building an IoT Empire workshops in the evening. Is there anyone else who wants to speak first? Because mine's just a, a video related to the shamanism discussion earlier. So there's there's no there's no original content in mine, but I think it's relevant and you'll enjoy it. If there's someone who has something prepared, you should totally go first or instead. No? Good. Okay, so we're just connecting the um, the audio for the video. Um, it's a shame that uh, Henrik Sandcleff isn't here, for the, those of you who know him. He's uh, one of the founders of this conference and a great lover of uh, stand-up comedy. Because um, what I want to show you is a short stand-up comedy clip. Who here was in the, the, the biohacking discussion? Two, three, four. Okay, three. So for those of you who weren't there, which is like uh, 30 people, <laughs> Uh, we were talking about um, definitions of nature and um, whether we should be worried about helping nature to defend itself or whether ne nature needs our help or whether when we help nature we're actually helping ourselves or what, what the relationship of, of power and stuff is there. So um, looks like we're ready to go. Uh, I don't necessarily... Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure that, so this, this is George Carlin, who's uh, one of the great stand-up comedians in, in my opinion, a bit like Bill Hicks, if anyone who knows Bill Hicks, this is it's kind of similar style. This is, this is his view on um, our relationship with nature. Yeah. Right. Worried about everything. You got people like this around you, country's full of them now. People walking around all day long, every minute of the day, worried about everything. Worried about the air, worried about the water, worried about the soil. Worried about insecticides, pesticides, food additives, carcinogens. Worried about radon gas, worried about asbestos. Worried about saving endangered species. Let me tell you about endangered species, all right? <laughs> saving endangered species is just one more arrogant attempt by humans to control nature. It's arrogant meddling. It's what got us in trouble in the first place. Doesn't anybody understand that? Interfering with nature. Over 90%, over, way over, 90% of all the species that have ever lived on this planet, ever lived, are gone. They're extinct. We didn't kill them all. <laughs> they just disappeared. That's what nature does. They disappear these days at the rate of 25 a day. And I mean regardless of our, our behavior. Irrespective of how we act on this planet, 25 species that were here today will be gone tomorrow. Let them go gracefully. Leave nature alone. Haven't we done enough? We're so self-important. So self-important. Everybody's going to save something now. Save the trees. Save the bees. Save the whales. Save those snails. And the greatest arrogance of all, save the planet. What? Are these fucking people kidding me? Save the planet? We don't even know how to take care of ourselves yet. We haven't learned how to care for one another. We're going to save the fucking planet? I'm getting tired of that shit. Tired of that shit. Tired. I'm tired of fucking Earth Day. I'm tired of these self-righteous environmentalists, these white bourgeois liberals who think the only thing wrong with this country is there aren't enough bicycle paths. People trying to make the world safe for their Volvos. Besides, environmentalists don't give a shit about the planet. They don't care about the planet. Not in the abstract, they don't. Not in the abstract, they don't. You know what they're interested in? A clean place to live. Their own habitat. They're worried that someday in the future they might be personally inconvenienced. Narrow, unenlightened self-interest doesn't impress me. Besides, there is nothing wrong with the planet. Nothing wrong with the planet. The planet is fine. The people are fucked. <laughs> Difference. Difference. The planet is fine. 
compared to the people, the planet is doing great. It's been here four and a half billion years. Did you ever think about the arithmetic? The planet has been here four and a half billion years. We've been here, what, 100,000, maybe 200,000? And we've only been engaged in heavy industry for a little over 200 years. 200 years versus four and a half billion. And we have the conceit to think that somehow we're a threat? That somehow we're going to put in jeopardy this beautiful little blue-green ball that's just a floating around the sun? The planet has been through a lot worse than us. Been through all kinds of things worse than us. Been through earthquakes, volcanoes, plate tectonics, continental drift, solar flares, sunspots, magnetic storms, the magnetic reversal of the poles, hundreds of thousands of years of bombardment by comets and asteroids and meteors, worldwide floods, tidal waves, worldwide fires, erosion, cosmic rays, recurring ice ages, and we think some plastic bags <laughs> and some aluminum cans are going to make a difference? The planet... The planet isn't going anywhere. We are. We're going away. Pack your shit, folks. We're going away. And we won't leave much of a trace either. Thank God for that. Maybe a little styrofoam. Maybe. A little styrofoam. The planet will be here and we'll be long gone. Just another failed mutation. Just another closed-end biological mistake. An evolutionary cul-de-sac. The planet will shake us off like a bad case of fleas. A surface nuisance. You want to know how the planet's doing? Ask those people at Pompeii who are frozen into position from volcanic ash how the planet's doing. Want well, to know if the planet's all right? Ask those people in Mexico City or Armenia or a hundred other places buried under thousands of tons of earthquake rubble if they feel like a threat to the planet this week. <laughs> How about those people in Kilauea, Hawaii, who build their homes right next to an active volcano and then wonder why they have lava in the living room? <laughs> the planet will be here for a long, long, long time after we're gone, and it will heal itself, it will cleanse itself, because that's what it does. It's a self-correcting system. The air and the water will recover, the earth will be renewed, and if it's true that plastic is not degradable, well, the planet will simply incorporate plastic into a new paradigm, the earth plus plastic. <laughs> the earth doesn't share our prejudice towards plastic. Plastic came out of the earth. The earth probably sees plastic as just another one of its children. Could be the only reason the Earth allowed us to be spawned from it in the first place. It wanted plastic for itself. <laughs> Didn't know how to make it. Needed us. Could be the answer to our age-old philosophical question, why are we here? <laughs> plastic. <laughs> Assholes. <laughs> so, so, the plastic is here, our job is done, we can be phased out now. And I think that's really started already, don't you? I mean, to be fair, the planet probably sees us as a mild threat, something to be dealt with. And I'm sure the planet will defend itself in, in, in the uh, manner of a large organism, like a beehive or an ant colony can muster a defense. I'm sure the planet will think of something. What would you do if you were the planet trying to defend against this pesky, troublesome species? Let's see. What might... Hmm. Viruses. Viruses might be good. They seem vulnerable to viruses. And uh, viruses are tricky, always mutating and forming new strains whenever a vaccine is developed. Perhaps this first virus could be one that, that compromises the immune system of these creatures. Perhaps a human immunodeficiency virus making them vulnerable to all sorts of other diseases and infections that might come along. And maybe it could be spread sexually, making them a little reluctant to engage in the act of reproduction. Well, that's a poetic note. And it's a start. And I can dream, can I? So don't worry about the little things. Bees, trees, whales, snails. I think we're part of a greater wisdom than we will ever understand. A higher order. Call it what you want. You know what I call it? The big electron. The big electron. Whoa. 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 It doesn't punish. It doesn't reward. It doesn't judge at all. It just is. And so are we. For a little while. Thanks for being here with me for a little while tonight.
I'm, I'm an environmentalist. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think it's an interesting point of view. Just wanted to share it with you guys to follow on the discussion. Thanks. Okay, does anyone change their mind and want to talk about something? Otherwise, is this on? there's also an option to talk tomorrow. There will also be lightning talks tomorrow. So if anyone... Okay, then we, you have another option to present your ideas tomorrow. Thank you for listening.